Okay. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, everyone. On behalf of the AgriLinks team, I would like to welcome you to the June Ag Sector Council webinar, which will showcase a tool for prioritizing climate-smart agriculture investments. The monthly Ag Sector Council seminar series is a product of the USAID Bureau for Food Security and is implemented by the Feed the Future Knowledge Driven Agricultural Development Project, also known as KDAD. My name is Julie McCarty, and I'm a Knowledge Management Specialist with the USAID Bureau for Food Security. I'll be facilitating the webinar today, so you'll see my name in the chat box and hear my voice during the Q&A session after the presentation. Thank you to everyone who has introduced yourself. It's always really fun to see that we've got a global audience for these events. Throughout the webinar, we encourage you to use the chat box to network, to share links and resources, and to ask questions about the presentations that we will pose to our speakers in the last half hour or so of the webinar today. So we'll hang on to your questions. And uh, when everyone's done presenting, we'll go ahead and start asking those. So today we're here to discuss the concept of climate smart agriculture, which is sometimes shortened to the acronym CSA, and how this approach might be applied by practitioners. We're going to showcase a tool called the Particip Participatory Systems Dynamics Model, and how the USA Zambia mission uses it to prioritize CSA investments. This webinar follows on the heels of a recent Feed the Future event called the Climate Smart Agriculture Global Learning and Evidence Exchange, or the CSA GLE, which was held in March in Zambia. It expands on a session there called the Farms to, Farms to Landscape session and focuses on one of the key messages that Climate Smart Agriculture is an approach and not just a list of practices. A great list of resources from that event can be found on AgriLinks and in that resources box that you see on the left of your screen. In addition, our webinar today stems from a February publication titled Climate Smart Agriculture and Feed the Future Program. This paper describes five areas of engagement to guide Feed the Future activities in integrating climate smart agriculture. And so we recommend that you take a look at that document, which is also available on AgriLinks and on the, uh, in that resources box on the left of your screen. Um, so we're going to get rolling now with the content. And so I would like to go ahead and introduce our three speakers. First up is Jerry Glover. Hold on one moment. All right. Jerry is our Senior Sustainable Agricultural Systems Advisor at the USA Bureau for Food Security, as well as the National Geographic Society Explorer. If you've attended any past AgriLinks webinars on soil management or sustainable intensification, you've probably heard Jerry's voice. Uh, he holds a PhD in soil science from Washington State University and has studied, among other things, native grasslands and farming systems, including no-till, perennial, organic, and integrated systems. Second up will be Robert Richardson. Robert is an ecological economist at Michigan State University uh, who's interested in the study of development and the environment, particularly the con contribution of ecosystem services to socioeconomic well-being. His research and outreach program focuses primarily on sustainable development, and he uses a variety of methods from behavioral and social sciences uh, to study decision making about the use of natural resources and conservation. Finally, we will hear from Harry Noma. Harry is a food security specialist with the Economic Development Office at USAID Zambia. He provides technical backstopping to feed the future activities in Zambia, including a research and development program called the Zambia Economic Resilience Program for Improved Food Security, also known as the MALA Project. And in addition, we have Mark Vasaki online as a featured contributor. He is our team lead at the Bureau for Food Security for Climate Smart Agriculture, and so you'll see his name in the chat box and hear him during the Q&A session. All right, without further ado, let's jump into the content. Uh, remember, you can post questions and comments in the chat box at any time and uh, we'll collect those for the Q&A session. All right, Jerry, you are up. Well, thanks a lot, Julie. Uh, so nice to see everyone online. Good morning, good day, and good evening to everybody. Uh, very happy to be here today to try and accomplish a couple of things, at least. One is to 
uh, give a bit of an overview of USAID's uh, Climate Smart Agriculture framework and why we're focusing our investments uh, where we are, and a little bit about the decision-making process that we go through in determining what to invest in. Uh, of course, today, one of the tools that we'll be talking about is that of um, uh, the dynamics modeling approach. But it's useful to first get into a little bit of the uh, perspective that USAID has on climate smart agriculture. I should say before we go on, you know, I, I uh, open up with this uh, slide of a small farming community. And one thing to notice there that, that's very relevant to this topic, of course, is how um, farm fields, farms fit into a larger landscape that includes natural, uh, natural areas, um, semi-natural areas, and so on. And, and when we do look at climate smart agriculture approaches, we do want to consider the broader impacts, the factors affecting the farm scale from the larger landscape, but also the, how the activities on the farm affect that larger landscape. So we're working in fairly complex landscapes in general, so that makes decision making a little bit more challenging. Okay. So just fundamentally, USAID's definition um, and use of climate smart agriculture is roughly the same as the uh, FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization. So we wish to sustainably increase agricultural production, uh, provide farmers with the ability to adapt to climate change, build their resilience, reduce their risk, and also uh, mitigate some of the uh, effects of agriculture on climate change along the lines of reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. We stress the, the part where appropriate because we understand that many of the farmers that we work with certainly aren't responsible uh, in large part for climate change. But where we can uh, find opportunities to reduce the impact of smallholder farming systems on climate change, we'd certainly like to take advantage of those opportunities. Now, we have some uh, principles for practice that have been identified. Uh, we Here, you know, the bottom line really is, is that Climate smart agriculture is not a single type of practice. It's not a, a single uh, innovation. But really, it's an it's a overall approach. And it's a process that's ongoing. So we really do want to take a systems approach, looking at the not just a particular uh, crop or even cropping system, uh, but also look at the how the farm operates overall and in the context of a larger landscape. Intentionality. Uh, on this one, we have many practices that actually produce benefits in terms of either improving adaptation to climate change or mitigating some of the impacts. But we don't want those just to be byproducts. We wish to develop strategic programs that really focus and uh, maximize the impacts on both of those on and off the farm field. We also look at the multiple benefits. We can't just rely on a few approaches that achieve some minor benefits, say, on, on adaptation or productivity increases. But we really are striving to identify win-win-win situations where we're able to accomplish multiple benefits uh, through, a, through a, a, a better overall strategy. And of course, we realize that it's not a uh, sort of paint by numbers effort. You have to take into consider the consideration the specific context that we're working in. Often, you know, uh, these these become very multi-layered. For example, you can be in nearly the same ecological environmental setting, but have very different socioeconomic or political factors that really affect what is possible and the impacts that are achieved. And the other thing is we're not just after um, uh, climate smart approaches that have uh, effects over the 
you know, near term for the farmer, but really, in a sense, that lay the foundation for long term resilience and uh, preparedness for farmers themselves. So really trying to set up our uh, farming communities to better prepare themselves to make better decisions in the future. Now, for this particular study, we're focusing on Zambia. And in Zambia, uh, much of the Feed the Future investments on improving agriculture are focused in the east, eastern part of the country. And in that region, uh, we've seen uh, fairly successful examples of, of implementation of agroforestry systems, such as this one pictured here. This is actually a farm in Malawi just across the border, but in very similar uh, area as what we find in eastern Zambia. And evergreen agriculture uses um, uh, perennial crops or shrubs or trees to really protect the soil and water resources over a much longer period of the year. We've found that they can, that these systems can uh, help improve annual crop production, increasing maize yields uh, two to three fold. We see often much better physical and biological conditions in the soil and uh, much better uh, organic carbon inputs into the soil. And all this helps manage water better. Water that strikes the soil surface is better, uh, it better in infiltrates the soil, is better stored and, and uh, released better to the above ground uh, plants. <clears throat> you can see this by a, a picture of the below ground setting where in this image uh, this soil profile in a maize field in which Phyderbia trees are planted. Uh, the Phyderbia trees are nitrogen fixing and they are also have these very nice robust root systems. They shed their leaves during the growing season for maize so they don't compete for resources. You'll see that the maize there is growing right up next to the base of that Phyderbia tree and uh, producing high yields of maize. Below ground, though, uh, you can see in the picture those large diameter tree roots punching down through uh, a soil limiting layer that maize grown alone would not likely be able to penetrate. And so without the trees there, uh, the maize roots would really be restricted to the soil volume above that root restricting layer. Uh, so that's, th that has obvious benefits for um, adaptation uh, and many other benefits, even unrelated to climate change. So we were interested to find out if, you know, these approach, if agroforestry systems could help us mitigate climate change, in particular by reducing deforestation pressures off farm. More on that in a minute. Another approach that uh, we've seen su successfully taken up in eastern Zambia is conservation agriculture uh, that operates by three basic principles. You want to minimize mechanical soil disturbance, so either using no-till direct seeding systems or uh, conservation tillage systems. You want to keep that soil covered with uh, crop residues as much as possible. As you see in the picture, um, at post-harvest, you have a lot of uh, maize stalks that have built up from previous seasons, so that's a nicely protected soil surface. And then the use of uh, diversification, typically through rotations or even through um, intercropping strategies, such as shown here where uh, so, uh, groundnut is being grown intercropped with pigeon pea. So uh, minimum soil disturbance, good soil cover with crop residues, and uh, diversification. Again, we see some real opportunities for adaptation and increased crop productivity. It's been successful in some areas being adopted by farmers, so it has real potential. So an interest here was, well, if farmers adopt this, improve their productivity significantly and increase their uh, adapt, uh, ability to adapt to climate change, 
what would be the impacts on uh, mitigation along the lines, again, of reducing pressures on deforestation. So why is that important, this, this uh, effort to reduce the pressure on deforestation? This is a satellite image of a uh, natural preserve along the Zambia-Malawi border. And you can see the very sharp line going roughly down the middle of the, of the image. On the right are uh, heavily farmed landscapes, essentially uh, without tree cover. And then on the left is the protected area. And increasing pressure for uh, charcoal production and on-farm fuel wood use endangers those protected areas. Uh, farmers go in there. It's very valuable, not just for the fuel wood and charcoal, but also for bush meat. So how does adoption of agroforestry and conservation ag, both of which seem to have clear adaptation and productivity benefits, how do they contribute to the mitigation part of the equation by helping reduce pressures on, uh, uh, on surrounding forest lands? Well, getting back to these principles for action, we wanted to have some decision-making tool so that we could prioritize. You know, for example, if, if agroforestry systems proved much more, um, had much more impact in conservation ag, we would want to put our investments there. Um, vice versa, if, if uh, conservation ag is, is a, you know, clear, clearly the winner, then that's where investment should go. But again, going back to we want a continuous process that looks at these challenges over time and over space, both on and off the farm, and really trying to maximize the synergies and reduce the trade-offs. Generally, there are trade-offs, but we would like, again, to find those win-win-win scenarios. And of course, there are specific socioeconomic, political, cultural, and environmental factors that need to be considered. And then how to put that together is, is really, uh, really one of our challenges. And again, taking the long-term perspective. So overall, where was the tool? You know, how could we do this? And that was, uh, that was the big challenge facing us in our research investments there in eastern Zambia. And that's when we began talking to uh, Michigan State University team with, uh, with Robbie. So with that, that kind of introduces why we, we selected Robbie's team to uh, take on this challenge, going through those principles for practice and our concepts around climate smart agriculture, and uh, really assessing the value of agroforestry systems or conservation agriculture uh, in, in addressing all three of those climate smart agriculture approaches. And with that, I'll uh, turn it over to uh, Robbie. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Julie. And uh, good day to all of you who are participating in this session. It's uh, a pleasure to see all of your names and uh, home countries uh, on the roster here. Um, and it's been a pleasure for me to be a part of this project. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to uh, discuss some of the outcomes with you in this webinar today. Um, I've been uh, involved in research projects related to agriculture and the environment in Zambia for about 10 years now. And uh, this project really allowed for an opportunity to explore some of the linkages between uh, agriculture and, uh, and the environment, its impacts on the environment. Just as a brief overview of uh, this discussion, um, I'm going to suggest here that the linkages between what happens on the farm and the impacts on landscapes and ecosystems are not well understood. And we are often influenced by closely held but, but, but poorly examined assumptions um, that are used to guide development investments and priorities in the, in the promotion of climate smart agriculture. Uh, and then finally, um, I'm going to suggest that participatory system dynamics modeling uh, as a tool can be effective in testing some of those closely held assumptions, uh, which can help to determine uh, priorities for development investment. 
I do want to emphasize here that this approach is very flexible and adaptable to other contexts. It's certainly not limited to, uh, for example, relationships between um, farm scale activities and deforestation. I do want to acknowledge my colleagues whose uh, contributions to this project were, were invaluable. Uh, the project itself uh, focused on sustainable intensification uh, and, and landscapes and livelihoods. We have called this the SIL project. And the main objective was really to examine the impact of sustainable intensification agricultural practices on the conservation of biodiversity in Zambia. As Jerry mentioned, the pilot sites for this project were Eastern Province and Lusaka Province, which are part of the zone of influence for, for US aid activities in Zambia. And we conducted the activities related to this project in 2014 uh, into 2015. To put this in some, in some uh, geographic and, and, and demographic context here, Zambia, relative, relative to its neighbors, Zambia has relatively low levels of population density, roughly half uh, the levels that um, we see uh, across the, the continent more generally. However, the population is growing rapidly from its present um, level of about 13 and a half million people. It's projected to triple by 2050 to around 43 million, increasing 10 times over present levels by 2100. All of this, of course, implies um, changes in the demand for food and energy. Zambia is also a rapidly urbanizing uh, country. And this, of course, has implications for how food and energy are distributed uh, across the country. Uh, and then finally, Zambia presently has a good deal of forest cover, but uh, suffers from high rates of deforestation. Estimates vary widely between 150,000 and roughly 300,000 hectares per year. But nevertheless, this uh, is one of the leading contributors to greenhouse emissions for the country. The implication of those trends, of course, are of interest to those of us who study food security because of the implications for the demand for food in the country. And of course, this is related to the demand for cropland and exactly the very issues that Jerry was describing in the introduction. The, the sort of conventional wisdom here uh, is that the practice of cultivating maize monoculture, maize being the staple crop of the region, uh, cultivating this in a monoculture system depletes soils of fertility. And farmers uh, will uh, want to then migrate to land abundant areas um, that would need to be cleared. So deforestation then would be driven largely by clearing land for agriculture. And there's some basis for this conventional wisdom. But this uh, highlights uh, problems related to soil degradation in an environment when agriculture is one of the few uh, livelihood activities um, available. So the dominant narrative here alluded to previously is that the deforestation is largely driven by smallholder farmers facing weak yields and degraded soil environments who abandon their fields and clear new land. And so the hypothesis going into this project was that something like sustainable intensification practices that increase yields or produce fuel would, re would reduce deforestation pressures. Uh, Jerry mentioned conservation agriculture. The in increased yields uh, from those kinds of practices would purportedly reduce needs for clearing land. And then agroforestry, uh, to the extent that it can provide on-farm fuel wood production, this would reduce demand for off-farm forest resources. Um, the, this is a map of the country. And you can see Eastern Province shaded in orange to the right, and Lusaka Province shaded in purple in the center lower part of the map. Um, these are very different provinces. And the Eastern Province is very rural, uh, with a good deal of forest cover um, and not a lot of uh, urban pressures. And Lusaka Province is uh, it contains a good deal of agriculture on the eastern side of the province, but it is, of course, a very urban province because of the location of the capital city. We went to this uh, project uh, using an approach called system dynamics modeling, which is a quantitative modeling tool that uses the, the kinds of systems approaches that Jerry mentioned in the introduction 
to analyze the impact of feedback loops in complex and dynamic systems. As I mentioned before, this is a, a very flexible tool that's been used in all kinds of uh, applications ranging from healthcare to national defense and ecological modeling. We use this tool in a participatory way, meaning that we involve uh, stakeholders and partners in the building of the model and its validation. And we used it in this way for this project to elicit stakeholders' views of the system, the agricultural environmental system, and how it operates. And we used that information to, to inform how the model was constructed. Um, and I mentioned that it is a, a very flexible and adaptable tool. The approach that we took uh, began with the identification of partners and stakeholders. Uh, I'll describe those groups in a moment. Um, those individuals were invited to an introductory workshop where they were invited to generate causal loop diagrams. And I'll give a couple of examples of what those uh, look like in just a moment. In the meantime, our research team uh, conducted a review of academic literature and gray literature on this topic, um, and we collected a, an immense amount of data that had been uh, assembled by various organizations in Zambia. And we used these causal loop diagrams and data to build a national level, level model of deforestation in a software package called Vensim. I'll mention that a version of Vensim is available for download for free. Um, and that's how we made this model available to some partners and stakeholders in, in Zambia. Um, we, we used this national level model in a, in a participatory workshop where we refined the structure of the model and, and its parameters with this group. And we used that re refined model to then uh, dive down to build provincial level models, so models of this system for both Eastern uh, Province and Lusaka Province, and used those models to develop uh, the outcomes of, that were provided in the final workshop and final report for the project. This took a, uh, about 15 months from the beginning to completion. The stakeholders and participants uh, who, who worked closely with us throughout this project are listed on this slide. And they include uh, local research organizations, several uh, representatives from uh, rep uh, international agricultural research centers, uh, University of Zambia and several NGOs active in these two provinces and in the region generally. This is an example of a causal loop diagram, a very simple one uh, that demonstrates the kinds of feedback loops that we see in complex systems. This one being um, that farmers use land uh, that they plant in either staple crops or cash crops and farm income then is generated uh, either from surplus uh, in staple crops or uh, produce generated in cash crops. This increases household income and ultimately household food supply in an economic security kind of feedback loop. Uh, a more complex feedback loop uh, represented here shows how um, the increase in the desire uh, for agricultural land contributes to deforestation, uh, which uh, has an impact on the total land available for again, cultivating staple crops and cash crops for the generation of smallholder farmer income. Just briefly uh, on forest in Zambia, we, we began using uh, land cover statistics that were provided by the integrated land use assessment that was supported by FAO uh, a few years, years ago. That um, assessment has recently been updated, and we plan to use the newer assessment in a revision of this model. Um, we represented forests in two types uh, in the model, one being deciduous and evergreen forests, and secondly, the more dominant dry forest type represented by Miombo woodland. Uh, in Zambia, urban households, it may be uh, worth pointing out, urban households largely depend on charcoal for a, an affordable cooking fuel, whereas rural households uh, typically use firewood as a cooking fuel because of the closer proximity to forest resources. Charcoal being a processed resource uh, is lighter and easy to transport. Uh, so thus, uh, because of this urban demand for charcoal, rural households may also engage in the production and selling of charcoal uh, as a livelihood. This is a common uh, site in the region, trucks loaded with bags of charcoal moving into urban areas for 
for sale. Uh, we're mentioning charcoal because it is an important source of deforestation along with the others listed here, the clearing of land for agriculture, the gathering of firewood, uh, construction of homes in, in rural and urban areas, and then the commercial timber sector. Okay, in terms of the results, uh, this is just, just briefly the baseline model for the national uh, level scale showing the decline, projected baseline decline in forest cover of these two forest types deciduous on the left and the more abundant Miambo woodlands um, declining a bit more steeply uh, on the right. So those are just based on business as usual levels of deforestation. Uh, this graph shows uh, at the national scale uh, the drivers of deforestation forecast from the baseline year of 2010 over 50 years to 2060. And it indicates here that, in fact, the, convert, the clearing and conversion of land for agriculture is a dominant driver of deforestation represented in blue. But uh, increasing rapidly just be, behind it is deforestation for charcoal production in red. Um, this highlights the, the rapid rates of urbanization that we see in Zambia and, and many other countries in the region that urbanization being accompanied by an increase in the demand for charcoal as, a, as an affordable and, and reliable cooking fuel. And then Miambo woodlands, you see similar trends where the dominant driver of clearing is land conversion, um, but rapid, rapidly rising behind it is land clearing for charcoal production. Okay. Um, the results in terms of the two provincial level models will follow. The eastern province baseline, uh, you will see eastern province has a great deal of forest now, um, but is projected to decline over time. It rates not quite as rapid as the national level, but, um, but fairly rapid loss rates here. When we look at the rates of uh, the contributions to deforestation by driver, we see that in Eastern Province, a very rural province, uh, it is uh, the clearing of land for agriculture uh, is the dominant driver of deforestation presently. But um, the clearing of land for charcoal production is increasing at a faster rate and overtakes or dominates the uh, drivers of deforestation by around 2045. So um, charcoal becomes a greater problem in eastern uh, province later on in the decade. And we see the same trend for Miambo woodlands, where uh, presently the dominant uh, driver of clearing is, in fact, clearing of land for agriculture, but uh, is overtaken by clearing of land for charcoal production later on in the, in the century. We also ran a few scenarios. So going back to climate smart agriculture, we modeled um, the effects of a tripling of maize yields on trends in deforestation, the, leading back to the objective of the project, which was to examine uh, a practice such as conservation agriculture. If it, in fact, led to increased yields, could this compel farmers to uh, have put less pressure on the forest? And, and what you see here is essentially no effect on deforestation. The baseline uh, projection of deforestation is represented in blue, and the effect of uh, a tripling of maize yields is represented in red, which was hidden behind the blue. So you, you see essentially no effect on deforestation. Similarly, we tested a, a scenario of a recurring drought every eight years and a more severe drought occurring every 40 years. And you see some rippling of that scenario in red behind the blue. Uh, uh, trend line, but essentially uh, the effect of drought uh, has, has very little impact on, on increasing or slowing deforestation. We tested another scenario which was full electrification across eastern province. And here you do see some impact of slowing of deforestation. Um, it certainly doesn't eliminate deforestation altogether in the projection. Uh, certainly, even the provision of full electrification throughout the province might not <clears throat> reduce its use altogether in, as a cooking fuel, in part because many households may not have access to electric cook stoves 
and would therefore continue to, to need uh, firewood um, for cooking fuel. As one uh, participant just pointed out as well, electricity is quite expensive and out of reach for some households as well for the daily needs of preparation of food such as cooking. A final scenario we tested uh, was the effect of fuel efficient charcoal stoves. Um, and that would in fact reduce the use of charcoal um, and firewood uh, with the effect of, uh, of, of efficient stoves. But again, it has a slight effect reducing pressures on forest um, more more so on the Nyamba woodlands because of their greater use in charcoal production. But it certainly doesn't eliminate deforestation. Uh, moving on to, to Lusaka province, uh, I mentioned before that this is a more urbanized province because it includes the national capital. Uh, and so the baseline projections of the two forest types, first of all, begin with a much lower baseline. We had something like two and three million hectares of these two forest types in eastern province. Um, you know, roughly, roughly uh, less than a third of that here. Um, but they also are projected to decline more steeply, uh, presumably because of their proximity to the city of Lusaka and its needs for forest resources as the city continues to grow. When we look at the drivers of deforestation by type in Lusaka province, we see that already charcoal is the dominant driver and it, it is projected to increase rapidly uh, across the coming 50 years, uh, overtaking um, all three, all four of the other drivers of deforestation combined. And similarly, for Miambo woodlands, uh, a more common forest type in this province, we still see uh, charcoal being a dominant driver today, increasing exponentially um, and well uh, in, in excess of all four of the other drivers of deforestation combined. Again, looking at this, the same scenarios that we ran before, the tripling of maize yields as a scenario <clears throat> did not appear to have any effect on reducing deforestation rates across the 50-year period. The scenario being represented in red, hidden behind the baseline in blue. Similarly to the previous uh, model in Lusaka province, the effects of drought were found to have a, a negligible effect only in periodic years. We may see a slight increase in deforestation because farmers may turn to uh, production of charcoal as a coping strategy during drought years, um, but overall negligible effects on deforestation under drought scenarios. <clears throat> Similarly, before, the effect of full electrification would have uh, some measurable and, and, and in some ways considerable effect in slowing deforestation in Lusaka province. Um, <clears throat> this is perhaps because we may see greater access to electricity and electric cook stoves in, in Lusaka than you might have seen in, in eastern province. Both forest types show uh, a slowing of deforestation under the scenario of full electrification. And similarly, the scenario of widespread use of fuel efficient stoves does appear to have some uh, effect of slowing deforestation across both forest types in Lusaka province. So in terms of some conclusions here, um, remember that we went into this, the development of this model asking, uh, would it be likely that, that um, activities such as the adoption of conservation agriculture and or agroforestry, could they have some impact in slowing deforestation on the landscape? What we find in this model is that the production of charcoal and the clearing of land for agriculture are currently both important drivers of deforestation in Zambia, it's just very differently at the two provinces. Charcoal currently dominates as a driver of deforestation in Lusaka province. The clearing of land for agriculture currently dominates as a driver of deforestation in eastern province, but charcoal is expected to dominate in both provinces in the future. The clearing of land for agriculture in this model is, is really driven by rural population growth, and not low yield or low, uh, I mean, high levels of land abandonment. We do see um, low yield and, and some land abandonment across the region, 
um, but it is the, the very high rates of rural population growth um, that result in the ensuing demand for land for farming and the, the resulting clearing of that land for agriculture. Charcoal production is largely driven by urban population growth and the related demand for energy in urban areas. So the, in, in, both, uh, in both scenarios, charcoal and uh, clearing of land for agriculture, it is the very high rates of population growth that are largely impacting the system. As a final conclu concluding point, um, I want to emphasize that participatory system dynamics modeling, as demonstrated in this uh, project, can be a useful tool for identifying the primary drivers of change in complex agroecological systems. And by identifying these primary drivers of change, this can allow um, donor organizations and development practitioners to focus on those primary drivers of change in prioritizing development invest investments. Final concluding point, um, these linkages that I spoke of in the beginning between what happens on farms and the impacts on ecosystems can be complex. And a tool like this one, a participatory system dynamics model, can be very useful in identifying these primary drivers of change. Uh, and then, uh, as mentioned before, I want to emphasize again that this approach is quite flexible and adaptable and can easily be um, uh, adapted to fit other complex systems. As I mentioned, it's been used in, in health, uh, national defense, uh, ecology, and, and many other contexts, depending on a particular mission uh, issues, concerns, and priorities. I'll stop there and uh, express my thanks for your, your involvement in this webinar today, and I'd be happy to answer any questions as they arise. Great. Thank you, Robert. Um, and Harry, I'd like to let you know I'm actually going to jump in right now and ask just a couple of clarifying questions for Robert, not kind of the, the broad questions, but a few specific questions uh, while we have you here since a, a bunch came in during your presentation, if that's all right. Um, let's see. Pulling up my questions. Um, so Robert, uh, we had one question from Eric Crawford who asked, did the, link, did the lack of a linkage between maize yields and deforestation that you showed have an empirical basis, or was it modeled that way by assumption? Thank you, Julie, and thank you, Eric, for the question. Not modeled, that by that, uh, modeled in that way by assumption. Um, again, the, the way the model was designed, it begins with this assumption that Zambia meets all of its food and fuel needs off the landscape. And the landscape consists of various land types, these two forest types, uh, savanna, agricultural land, and, and maybe a couple of more from the integrated land use assessment. Um, and then we begin with uh, a sort of business as usual um, uh, uh, set of parameters where we estimate the average um, maize consumed by a household, the average fuel wood consumed by a household, and so forth, and then combined with population projections that were provided by the UN Population Division, the United Nations Population Division, we used its median estimate uh, for population growth, which is forecast both at the urban and, and rural scale. So by simply modeling projected population uh, growth uh, across the, the demand for food and fuel from the landscape, um, it is, it, is, it is that which led to the conclusion that rural population growth was the greater driver of, of the clearing of land uh, because of the demand uh, for land uh, for, for agriculture by new entrants into agriculture as the population grows. Again, I want to emphasize that this is all based on a greater assumption of business as usual, and that would be that um, According to the, you know, these population growth estimates, um, average rural households continue to uh, produce um, and consume foods at current rates um, and consume wood fuel at current rates uh, and so forth. Similarly, at the urban scale, uh, urban, urban population growth consuming present levels of charcoal, consuming present levels of, of maize and, and other foods 
um, this is really the structure of the model. Um, the the tripling, the, the scenario of the tripling of maize yield was just something that we kind of made up as, an, as a what-if scenario. Um, would, would producing higher levels of maize per hectare, um, does it, you know, based on the structure of the model, does it demonstrate any slowing of, of that, of the rates of deforestation? And we essentially, as I mentioned, found no effect, mostly um, because of the lack of any kind of, you know, conceptual linkage, except other than the, the hypothesized suggestion that that farmers are abandoning the land because of, of, of low yields. So hopefully that, um, that answers Eric's question. I'll pause now and, and turn back over to Julie. Hi, uh, Jerry's actually going to chime in with a quick question for you. Actually, it was a response to a, to a question by Pascal about whether from this, is it better to invest in agroforestry or CA? Um, the answer is actually that it, it, not so much whether it's better to invest in them, but to be clear about why we're investing in them. And I think this study shows that if we want a climate smart system, rather than just some climate smart agricultural practices, the you know we'll have to look further afield to the energy sector to some um, you know, cultural issues around charcoal use and so on. But there are many good reasons otherwise to continue investing in agroforestry and CA practices. So you know, it's important to know why we're investing and to get to the bottom of some of those assumptions that Robbie outlined earlier on. We no longer should, in this region at least, just assume that because we increase yields, uh, or produce more on-farm fuel wood that that farmers will somehow be reducing uh, deforestation pressures. We'll have to look elsewhere for that. Great, thank you, Jerry. And uh, Robert, I'll just ask you one or two more quick clarifying questions before we move on to Harry. Um, so we had a question about whether you included any farmer organizations or Zambian farmer representatives among your stakeholders, and also whether Food for Peace was part of the USAID group. Can you quickly answer that? Yes, I can quickly answer. In both cases, uh, the answer is no. Um, and to the first point, including Zambian farmers or farmer organizations, um, I would suggest that, that in, in many ways this was a shortcoming. This, this group of partners and stakeholders was largely experts, uh, agricultural researchers, um, forestry researchers, um, uh, economists, and so forth. Uh, we did stumble at times in, in understanding um, the way decisions are made about the allocation of the land. Um, but we were able to get some uh, clarifications by connections with, uh, with with village headmen and so forth, and then uh, briefly the answer to your the second part about the food for peace group they were not included in this uh, group of partners and stakeholders, not by design that we we um, reached out to um, partner organizations that the Zambia mission currently works closely with, um, and fund some some activities on the ground in these two provinces, and um, Harry may be able to speak to uh, some of how the particular partner and uh, stakeholder organizations were selected. Great, thank you. And lastly, we had a question about whether the baseline model projections that you showed come from the system dynamics model. Does that make sense as a question? Uh, no, let's see. If I understand the question correctly, um, the baseline deforestation uh, statistics that I showed were a product of the system dynamics model, um, but they were largely based on current and projected rates of deforestation across these two land cover types. Um, so again, the baseline is based on business as usual um, 
rates of deforestation on the landscape. All of the other models are based on hypothetical or what-if scenarios. OK, uh, great, thank you. Um, I'll pass it to Jerry quickly, but then we'll head over to Harry, because we don't want to, uh, to cut off his time too short. So Jerry? Very quick, very quick remark about some additional, I guess, co-products co from this effort. Uh, besides the conclusions that uh, Robbie drew from the modeling process, there were also some very welcome outcomes just in terms of uh, bringing those partners together and getting a clear overall picture of decision making, of opportunities, uh, and so on. So that uh, participatory part of the process was very useful and uh, will contribute to several, several other efforts uh, moving forward. It also importantly identified gaps in information and knowledge. So we had some questions and we had assumed that there would be readily available answers to the many questions needed to, to build the model and so on. But, uh, you know, that wasn't necessarily the case. And just the process of identifying where the information and data gaps were uh, will, will prove, I think, uh, very valuable moving forward into other uh, regions and countries. Thank you, Jerry. All right, we'd like to go ahead and pass the microphone over to Harry for your presentation. And then we'll circle back for some additional questions after that. So Harry, please go ahead and unmute your microphone and take it away. I Should I hear you. you? There you are. I hear you now. OK, thank you. Yes, I was just saying that um, I'm speaking from Lusaka Zambia to share with you how we used this participatory system dynamics model to try and prioritize investments in Zambia. As you heard from Jerry and, uh, and Robert, this study was done in, in 2015. Uh, this was almost like midway through our Feed the Future program as well as the Global Climate Change programs which Zambia is implementing. So in a way, we did not use it to formulate these programs, but we have used the results from this model to start thinking you know, outside the box in terms of how we move forward as a country. To give you a bit of perspective uh, of what I'm going to talk about, um, I'll just give you an overview of where we're operating from, which I think uh, Jerry also mentioned, that we're in the eastern part of Zambia. And um, the areas that you see shaded are the ones which we are covering under the Feed the Future, as well as the global climate change. I'm sure most of you know Zambia for its copper production. But uh, did you also know that it is the third most forested country in Africa? So this has big implications in terms of um, uh, contributing towards the environmental harvesting of, of, of carbon dioxide, which, which is a big issue for global warming. And Zambia is also surrounded by eight neighboring countries. And as such, we see Zambia becoming a very important uh, player in terms of food security, especially in, in the recent years when we have seen that the impacts of the El Nino and climate change are, are bringing very serious food security situations in the sub-region where we are. So because of these factors, USID Zambia has been supporting the Zambian government to address its capacity to produce more food for both nutrition and the uh, uh, and surplus sales for, for for neighboring countries and in addition to that we have also invested in building the capacity of Zambia to manage these forests and wildlife reserves which which are also important uh, um, economic uh, activities that the country can do so after my presentation I hope you'll be able to learn how we have used our, 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 our model, which we participated in, to prioritize our investments. So in, in introducing the model, as, as uh, Robert indicated, we wanted to sort of understand what are the linkages between what farmers at household labor are doing in terms of uh, adopting technologies or systems that can increase their productivity in terms of yield, and how these relate to 
conservation of the environment, the forests, as well as the larger uh, biodiversity, including wildlife. We wanted to understand that because I think the theory was that um, what is driving, you know, deforestation was, was, was the inability of farmers to produce enough food and hence they tend to expand their fields to produce more food. So the model really was intended to give us that kind of, of framework to help us, you know, think outside the box for a future program. We do know generally that improving the integration between agriculture, forests, and, and biodiversity and wildlife is important, you know, for a sustainable uh, management of our environment. So, um, what I can also tell you about Zambia is that uh, despite this huge economic performance that the country has been experiencing in the last 10 years where the gross domestic product has been in excess of 5%, we still have serious challenges with 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 um, um, poverty. Eighty percent of the population is still living at below a dollar twenty-five cents per day, and in fact, half of that is living at about sixty-eight cents per day. So this is really deep poverty which we are trying to to, to fight. And in these rural areas, the majority, eighty percent, depend on agriculture, and this is all rain-fed agriculture with with no irrigated uh, systems. And it's also with very little mechanization. So given the kind of climate change you're experiencing now where the rainfall is coming late or there is, you know, drought in between the growing periods, it's very difficult for farmers, small scale farmers, to respond and ensure that they produce enough for, for their home consumption as well as for sale. And I should also mention that Zambia is among the worst countries in Africa, which is affected with stunting, where we have 45 to 50 percent of children under the age of two being stunted. And of course, this has implications in terms of potential development in later years. And we heard from uh, Robert that although Zambia has is, is got a low population density compared to other countries, we see the population going to really increase by 2100, uh, by the year 2100, as uh, Robert indicated. And uh, Zambia is also among some countries which have very high urban rates, over 40%. So this has huge implications as we had in terms of food and also in terms of, of energy, especially in the urban areas. So what have we been doing as USID Zambia to counter some of these challenges that Zambia is facing? Um, USID Zambia is actually implementing two initiatives, two US government initiatives, which we call one is the Feed the Future, which is a program, of course, funded by the U.S. government to combat global hunger and, and uh, undernutrition as well as poverty. We have four key areas which we are trying to address there. We want to help farmers increase their smallholder productivity, that's basically yield, by encouraging crop diversification and uh, other climate smart technologies. We are also working around improving their access to markets as well as trade and ensure that uh, they are able to do value addition with the involvement of the private sector and ensuring that the, the environment for, for business is also conducive. We are also investing in uh, improving the resilience of these vulnerable households to ensure that uh, they are able to produce enough through, through what they are growing. And the fourth one is recross cutting where we want to ensure that as the farmers produce whatever they are growing at the households, it should be environmentally friendly. So we are focusing really on four key value chains, maize, basically as the major staple, and then being grown in rotation with legumes, including soybeans and groundnuts, and then oil crops, and the other fourth one is horticulture. So really, agriculture diversification is what we have been trying to promote, and we have a number of projects that have been doing that. We had a program that was looking at uh, research to support the kind of technologies that farmers required to, to, to adopt for them to increase productivity. And the number of uh, technologies were developed under the, the, the research program, for example. But we still have research gaps in terms of disseminating those technologies. We also had you know, gaps around the seed systems for these legumes, especially in terms of how do you get this to be commercialized. And we, we have obviously Noted, but it's not enough to just invest in research alone. You also require a way of disseminating 
some of these products that you develop under research. Uh, it's also very, very important, we have noted that to have uh, a policy and data system that is uh, going to inform government to ensure that the decisions they make, whether it's with regards to subsidies of agricultural inputs, is based on proper evidence. And so we have invested quite a lot in creating um, a local think tank here through our 10 years of support, I think, to, 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 through MSU. And uh, now we do have an organization known as AWAPRI that is leading research and has become a strong voice, I think, which government listens to in terms of providing evidence in agriculture. And economic res resilience as well as nutrition is also not being left out, including gender mainstreaming, because we do realize that um, without changing the behavior of how households make decisions, adoption of these innovations and all these messages we're trying to take, whether it's nutrition messages or agricultural messages, cannot, cannot really take off until people, you know, start changing their, their traditions and the way they believe they should be doing business. The Global Climate Change Initiative actually is the intended to um, build the capacity for Zambia. As I said earlier on, to ensure that they are able to um, reduce the emission of greenhouse gas uh, gases into the environment. So number one, really what we are looking at is trying to ensure that Zambia has the capacity to manage its natural resources sustainably. And um, we are doing that through working with the, you know, district uh, government officers as well as local communities to ensure that at the end of the day, they can, they can manage these the resources profitably and the resources, the, the, the benefits that come out of those are shared equally between them. And uh, we have a number of programs that are doing that. Um, basically, we are all contributing towards the reduced emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. So in terms of lessons from the model, which uh, Robert talked, talked about on a great deal, how are we using those to inform our new sort of programs moving forward? Just to recap, um, we did hear that charcoal production and agriculture are both important drivers of deforestation in this country. And we see this from the picture there, which I got uh, in yesterday's newspaper, one of our leading newspapers in Zambia, where a reporter just got a shot of a cyclist carrying more than six bags of charcoal as a way of raising money to buy food due to a number of reasons. One, you know, the, the, the reduced coal production because of the, the, the onino we had in Zambia is really becoming very, very important. We did hear that in eastern province of Zambia where the Feed the Future program as well as the Global Climate Change programs are operating, the major drivers for deforestation is, 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 is agriculture. But here in Lusaka, it is charcoal. So indeed, understanding these two different uh, drivers is very, very important in terms of us trying to design programs that are going to address these, these, these concerns in the two areas. Uh, looking forward, charcoal becomes a major driver in both, province, both provinces, I think, as you saw from the model. And uh, we, we did also hear that the, 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 the agricultural, uh, agriculture as a driver in eastern province is really mainly through population growth. These are new families that are, because they, they are, they are, they are, their fathers can, their fathers land cannot be subdivided any further. They move out of those villages to go and start opening up new fields in areas which were normally forest areas. We see very little, of course, of people moving out of those areas because of the decline in soil fertility. So really, child production in the urban areas is an issue that we, we really have to deal with. And this, we have learned that is mainly driven, of course, by the, by the population growth. OK. So yes, I was saying that despite the kind of um, uh, results which the model has shown us, that uh, in urban areas, the, the, the drive of deforestation is charcoal and in, in, in you know, rural areas like Eastern Province is agriculture. Uh, and moving forward, charcoal is going to be the, the big issue. We cannot say let's stop focusing on increasing productivity of, 
of a cultural land. Because we do know that if these people do not have livelihoods, especially those people in, in rural areas, they will tend to charcoal as a very easy way of making money. So we have to continue investing in, in ensuring that people produce enough in the face of you know, climate variability. We also now know that we need to have alternative energy sources for people in urban areas because these are the ones that drive the demand for charcoal. Uh, different provinces is like five hours away from Lusaka and uh, when driving out there, that's why you, you cross through the Luongo Valley which is um, an area for, 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 for wildlife as well as a lot of forests and we see a lot of charcoal being harvested in those areas again. Um, I cannot see my my slides, but anyway, I'll continue speaking from my my paper slides here. Please do, Harry. We'll if that's we'll okay. move back up in just a moment. Okay. So, so yes, I was saying that um, what's the linkage between the efforts to increase productivity at farm level, which are calling intensification, are not so so clear or obvious as we heard from from Robert, where the model was showing that even at the threefold increase of maize yields, it basically has no effect on reducing deforestation. What we are saying here is that we cannot simply say that's a wrong investment, we shouldn't go into you know, technologies that increase productivity because they have no, no impact on deforestation because obviously as long as people don't produce enough food, they will tend to the forest to, to, to make their livelihood. Um, yeah, so we have also learned that uh, with this demand of, of energy in urban areas, we really need to have programs that also address the, the energy requirements of people in the urban areas. And so one of the programs we have in Zambia, which we, we are part of now, is the Power Africa Initiative. And uh, this is uh, incorporating all sorts of clean energy to help Zambia meet its uh, energy demands, which, for example, this year, because of uh, of reduced rainfall, we have had challenges of, of generating power through hydro, hydroelectric uh, uh, power plants. And then with this population growth as the number one driver in the long run, we need to start looking at the uh, family planning as an important issue to, to, to incorporate. So as we are designing our country development cooperation strategy for the next five years, which is going to sort of like guide our investments for the next five years, we want to ensure that uh, health programs that have the, the resources to go into issues of family planning are co-located with the, our country investments. And then uh, we, we, we also know that adoption of uh, these technologies, whether it's the energy, you know, serving uh, stoves or indeed the uh, agricultural technologies, the adoption is, is really not that high. And we really need to start thinking about how can we change that behavior, bringing in social behavior kind of um, interventions to see how we can tweak some of the kind of activities we're doing to ensure that maybe adoption of these technologies can increase and result in the kind of benefits we want to see in the long run. And finally, climate change, I think for people who are living in rural areas, is seen as a bigger threat to their well-being more than the, you know, deforestation. For people in, 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 in rural areas who depend on, on the environment, on the land for their livelihoods, they are looking at what are they going to eat today. So they, they really don't so much prioritize the issue of preserving forests. They have to survive for the day. So we really need to ensure that uh, um, the, the livelihoods of people who live in those environments is cut out for to ensure that you know the conservation of the environment in the long run is, is achieved. Otherwise, we cannot just do one thing and forget the other one. Um, we I did say that although the linkage between 
you know, attrition intensification or increased productivity, and the deforestation as demonstrated in the model was weak. We should not lose focus on addressing those food production requirements, given that the population will be growing, and that's an important area we should continue working on. And uh, for Zambia, again, we have had this notion that we have plenty of land with the almost two, two, two people per, per hectare. Um, <coughs> farmers ought to have abundant land and, and expand, but uh, the, the key thing really here is that we do experience well, farmers have been telling us that they don't have any more land to expand. And this is really primarily based on the, the fact that a lot of them are, are located along areas which have infrastructure, developed infrastructure such as roads, um, where there are schools and things like that. So in terms of looking in the long run to ensure that the environment is properly managed, we have to look at infrastructure development and ensure that you know commercialization of a crash in those areas is eased. We also need to look at the, the land titling system, which should enable people to easily get titles as well, because currently it's only maybe the, the rich or elite who are able to process titles easily. And we need to look at uh, how land can be made more available to smallholder farmers in the long run by reviewing sort of our land act. And so, again, emphasizing that uh, the role of broad based agricultural growth uh, in this economic environment where the uh, uh, population is likely to grow is still going to remain very, very important and we still have to continue focusing on that. I think largely, in fact, for most African countries, a lot of people depend on, on agriculture. So, with the right invest investments and uh, community level planning uh, for conservation, you know, multiple uh, revenue streams are possible to come out of uh, these areas in terms of tapping into the wildlife, tourism, fisheries, and livestock. And uh, that holds potential, but, you know, uh, communities need to be managed, and these this require sort of long-term planning. Um, we also know that uh, with the right community organization and provision of infrastructure, small-scale farmers can also be very important uh, um, players in the food value chain ensuring that, you know, they contribute to the economic uh, um, growth of the country. And we still think that small-scale farmers will continue playing a very important role for conservation in Zambia. Um, if they're able to remain fixed on their parcels of land without really, you know, invading on the, on the, on the, on the larger um, landscape, but to do that, they really need to increase their productivity they also need to, you know, divest their crop productivity as well and ensure that uh, this can be passed on from generation to generation. And finally, behavior change is going to be very, very important. You know, what is the best way we are going to bring this change? Are we, should we be using maybe children as entry points? And in the long run, how do we engage the youth to ensure that they are interested still in agriculture, which, because currently with that mechanization, a lot of people just, you know, move away and go to towns. And um, scaling up of some of these good, you know, practices requires a, a, a very good uh, phase kind of approach because you need to identify what is working and why, you know, our farmers are not adopting those practices that they are not adopting. So this is what I wanted to share. I hope that you have learned one or two things. Thank you very much. All right, we'll go ahead and ask a few more questions for our presenters uh, before we wrap up today. Let's see, we had a lot of great questions come in and great discussion in the chat box. Thank you very much. Um, I thought I would just jump in with a, a little bit of a basic couple of questions about what CSA is. Um, so this might be for Jerry and Mark. Um, Yuka Makino asked, do you consider changing of crops in other words, uh, less water consuming or adapted to saline crops as moving uh, um, as climate smart agriculture. So changing to those kinds of crops, does that count as CSA? Um, and also, does the climate smart agriculture discussion also apply to steps farther in the value chain, post-harvest in the supply chain? Um, 
particularly when crops have had to be changed due to changing climate conditions. There's a lot of discussions on increasing production, but is there also a major issue um, in harvest, storage, and transport to be addressed in the CSA realm? You can adjust that quickly. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, and the question itself reflects what I think is, is good uh, systems thinking. So indeed, we do take our thinking about uh, climate smart agriculture to that larger systems, including uh, post-harvest and processing issues. Um, and, and so it is that, that larger system. Now you asked about, is a, a uh, drought tolerant crop, is that com considered climate smart agriculture? I think it's most properly considered as one part of a climate smart agriculture approach. Um, we have seen cases where a new improved drought tolerant crop is planted but not managed properly or is not accompanied by other climate smart agriculture approaches in, in terms of soil management. Um, fertilizer management and so on that fail. I was in Malawi recently and looked at uh, drought tolerant beans that were completely dead um, and, and, and in part because uh, you know they, the spacing was not right and the tillage practices were, were not very well suited to the particular weather conditions of that year. So it's a part of an overall climate smart agriculture approach uh, which more broadly does look at the food system overall. Of course, some parts of USAID focus more on those other parts of the food system. For example, roads, you know, properly constructed, well-planned roads can be part of a climate smart uh, food system that's uh, usually outside the uh, realm of uh, the Bureau for Food Security Investments focused on smallholder farmers. But we do try to coordinate and plan our climate smart agriculture activities within that larger uh, food system. Um, to add to what Jerry had said is that uh, the U.S. government has, has moving forward has mandated that we protect all our investments on climate smart, uh, on, on the climate change and uh, Part of our reaction to to protecting those investments is our climate smart agricultural strategies, which will hopefully look at uh, what activities we're doing in the future and how climate is going to affect those activities and how we what we need to do to protect those investments so that they will be in place for years to come. Thank you both. Right. We had a question about the applicability of the model that was presented today. How can other USAID Feed the Future missions use it? And at what level? CDCS versus the PADS. In addition, how can projects incorporate uh, participatory systems when they are already mid-implementation rather at the beginning? Uh, I'd say we'll let Mark, chime in on the phone and then see if anyone else wants to. Well, according to you know the uh, the process that we do in USAID with our country development uh, cooperative strategies is that every five years we look at where we're going to go and what we want to do. Um, but it, part of that process is also the assessments of what, um, how to make an informed decision, and and then uh, with our CDCSs. Uh, we make a determination to uh, how climate uh, change will affect our projects under that uh, CDCS and moving forward. So we, so we, uh, what we mandate uh, the missions to look at is to see if they will be at a low, medium, or high risk uh, moving forward in their particular countries on the effects of climate change um, and, and those particular types of programming. For example, uh, technical assistance may not be heavily influenced by climate change, but uh, uh, agricultural practices, things like that, uh, roads, infrastructure, may be heavily influenced by what, what climate 
uh, changes could be coming in the future. Then after we develop our CDCSs, then we do our more detailed planning for our projects and activities. And that's where the, these, these tools are very helpful in bringing about um, um, de informed decisions on what, what to invest in and how to, to mitigate any, any losses or, or uh, effects on investments moving forward. And this is Jerry, uh, just to comment on how this might fit in mid-program level. Uh, I think it would fit in very well. And in fact, that's what we did there in Zambia. So we had activities going on. We had some questions about the assumptions that we were making about the investments that we had uh, specifically. You know, to what extent uh, are these investments in agroforestry and CA meeting our uh, broader needs on the landscape level. Um, so it really did help pin down uh, some of the details that we needed, identify some of the knowledge gaps, and has now our investments mm -hmm. going forward. So I think it's very appropriate, even midterm, uh, to do a to do something like this. On the upside, uh, for for missions, you can uh, actually midway identify. Uh, greater impacts of your investments that you can then report and, and uh, get out to others. I mean, those lessons learned from each mission can help the guy can help guide the investments for for many others. So, I think midway is is fine. Uh, I will say, um, uh, uh, Erica Felix asked the question: How much did this modeling study cost, and how long did it take? As as Robbie pointed out, roughly 15 months. And uh, the entire project uh, had about a $350,000 budget. I should say, though, that it also included a biodiversity component that Robbie didn't comment on. And uh, as a sort of um, a prototype of this approach for assessing our climate smart agriculture approaches, it was undoubtedly more expensive than uh, what it what it needs to be in the future, particularly, I think, for surrounding uh, countries, countries where some of the situation, some of the characteristics would be similar to Zambia. And so my hope is, is that we can get, get this down as, get, get the cost down to, to a level that we can use it as a diagnostic tool much more frequently and uh, use it either at the beginning of program design or even the midway uh, check for course correction and, and other things. Uh, maybe Robbie has a comment on, you know, you know, if we're looking at potentially significantly lower costs going forward uh, for other similar situations. Absolutely. Thank you, Jerry. Um, I agree with your point about um, this particular project. Um, first of all, we, as you know, we didn't uh, even spend the entire budget that was originally allocated for it. And the construction and, and development of this model had a, a steeper learning curve to do something in a similar context, similar, um, similar you know, agricultural context and ecological context, uh, I think would be much simpler. Um, if the context were dramatically different, it could be, uh, you know, somewhat less less costly, but in a similar context, I think it could be um, much less expensive. Thank you all. Uh, this is a question for Harry. In Zambia, did you see donor cooperation, or, or is there oh. donor cooperation around efforts to integrate investments in productivity and in preventing deforestation? Uh, yes, we we do have uh, a donor group meetings. I think the one under agriculture and environment where these issues are discussed. And USAID actually has been leading the the donor group. I think in the last three years. And um, yeah, resources are in terms of budgets, in terms of what is being invested in, for example, agricultural productivity or. or management of natural resources, these are all being shared, and I think the coordination is, is moving in the, in the right direction.
Thank you, Harry. All right. This. Um, we have, we have a lot of questions coming in today, and so we'll ask a, few, a couple more. We'll run slightly over time, uh, but then we'll need to wrap up. But I promise that we will share all of the questions that came in today with our presenters and uh, continue the conversation on the agrilinks.org website. All right, there was a question that came in during Robert's presentation um, saying that there that the absence of a clear demarcation between farm scale and landscape poses a problem of incompatible and even sometimes conflicting priorities. Are there any suggestions to address this problem? Could, could, Robert, can you chime in on that yeah, one? Yeah, could you just repeat the first part of the question? It didn't come through clearly. Sure. Um, it was a question or a statement that the absence of a clear demarcation between farm scale and landscape poses a problem of, of conflicting priorities. Yes, I'll give a couple of examples of how that, that demarcation became problematic. As Jerry mentioned a couple of times, biodiversity was an important part of this project's objectives. And we had hoped to, to look, you know, to take that into account by looking at the impacts of what happens at the farm scale on wildlife. Um, in this region, wildlife are abundant. There are a number of national parks nearby which have species that are valued both uh, you know, for bushmeat and also for, for export products. This is all illegal. Um, and so it, the, the issue was raised several times. You know, some of this wildlife uh, and biodiversity, the habitat is in so-called game management areas adjacent to national parks where many smallholder farming households live and grow food. And this leads to some conflict, um, such as, you know, say, elephants trampling through crops and, and leading to crop losses from, the, from these damages. That's one example of where, you know, you start to see some, some conflict between multiple objectives of, say, promoting climate smart agriculture and promoting biodiversity conservation in the same region um, when, in fact, maybe those two activities are incompatible or at least not well aligned. Excellent. Thank you. And I think we'll perhaps just ask uh, one more question because we are coming up on the end of our time today. And this is a question that is most likely directed at Jerry and Mark, is it fair or possible to actually choose between adaptation or mitigation efforts in the context of a Feed the Future activity, bearing in mind limited resources and often a five-year uh, activity or intervention time? Yeah, I mean, it, sometimes we do have to make those difficult decisions. And um, you know, wh one thing that can make it easy is that sometimes our funding streams are specifically designated for adaptation or mitigation, uh, not always both. Um, so in, in some cases, we do um, prioritize uh, mitigation activities for a particular region. For Feed the Future initiative, uh, we would generally prioritize adaptation because we we really are focused on the impacts on smallholder farmer livelihoods and realizing that the burden on mitigating climate change is really on on us in the developed uh, world and that's why in the climate smart agriculture uh, objectives for USAID we emphasize mitigation where appropriate. Uh, so overall, I think that we do uh, prioritize adaptation strategies that directly benefit smallholder farmers. But we really do want to take advantage of the opportunities where we can uh, help farmers mitigate their overall impact on the environment. Mark, anything to add? No, I think it's a good, that's a good summary. But um, uh, and Jerry is completely right, is that our funding streams sometimes don't allow both. But in, in a lot of cases, I think if the mission looks really hard, sometimes we can find areas that are win-win, both for adaptation and mitigation. 
Um, and we may not be able to measure both, but we'd be able to at least get uh, uh, some um, activities that, that can uh, cover both of those areas. Um, for us, mitigation is, is pretty much about emissions more than anything else. And, uh, and uh, we do work a lot more on Feed the Future on adaptation because it's, it's, it's a little bit closer to what kind of works we do. Um, mitigation has a lot more um, history in our global uh, climate change office and how, how they uh, tackle that, that problem as well. But, but both Jerry and I and the uh, Office of Global Climate Change uh, are working and talking together and see where we can cooperate a lot more uh, between our projects. And I do, I do believe we are getting much better at, um, at uh, getting those win-win, uh, taking advantage of those win-win opportunities and working with the missions and uh, bureaus here in Washington, D.C. to ensure that, uh, that mitigation funds complement adaptation activities and ad adaptation funds complement and support mitigation strategy. So overall, I think that we're getting better, and in part because we're using tools uh, like that uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Richardson used to really get to the heart of some of the assumptions that we often had, but didn't have the you know it, we didn't we hadn't yet really questioned those assumptions. So as we question the assumptions as we've done here and expand our knowledge base, I think we are getting better at achieving the, the triple wins of climate smart agriculture. Wonderful. Well, I would like to extend a sincere thank you to our presenters, uh, Jerry, Robert, and Harry, and of course, Mark Rosaki for chiming in as well. And thank you also to the entire AgriLinks team for continuing to run this webinar series. Most importantly, thank you to you, our participants. Uh, we really appreciate having such an excellent uh, participatory audience today. We appreciate your questions, and we'll share those with the presenters. Uh, if you attended the webinar today, you will receive an email with the recording and other post-event resources, which we hope you will find helpful. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you at future events.